Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, Fading Memories listeners, and thank you once again for choosing to listen to our show. Today, as I mentioned, we have Kim Best. She is the author of the book, How to Write the Last Chapter of Your Life. I hope to God I got that right. This is the day after my daughter's wedding, so my brain is a little bit frazzled. So thanks for joining me, Kim. (laughs) Hi, Jennifer. It's great to be here. I'm going to give you the real title of the book. Oh, thank you. I'm always good at butchering names. (laughs) You know, I'm an avid reader, and um, I never can remember the titles or the authors. But, you know, so (laughs) the book is titled How to Live Forever, A Guide to Writing the Final Chapter of Your Life Story. And um, I, I go, the, my uh, podcast pet is here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I called it How to Live Forever because our stories live on. I believe our stories are our legacies. And then writing our last chapter, whatever that looks like, um, we're leaving the memory of us. So um, it's How to Live Forever, a guide to writing the final chapter of your life story. But this is more than ri- just writing your story, correct? This is kind of how to live your best life so that you have a good story to write? Yeah. So I um, have been a registered nurse since I was 19. I'm way many more decades than that now. (laughs) Didn't mean to make you choke on your coffee. Uh, (laughs) But, uh, you know, switched into being a mediator. But the one thing that people have taught me from um, sitting in the space that is often end of life. So I worked in trauma, every intensive care there is, and finally emergency department. We don't know when that last moment will be. And our failure to prepare for that means that a lot of people carry uh, burdens of choices um, and closings that we can have by having those kinds of conversations early. So my book is divided into the things that I have realized have been people's biggest struggle to have conversation around, and that is the legal decisions, the healthcare decisions, the celebration of life decisions. And then the most important thing is relationships, fractured relationships. Um, I'm I'm hoping to mitigate for regret. So in that final moment, when we're we're at the end of our story, um, we can have as much peace as possible. So closing the loops that keep that from happening is what my book tries to address. Which is awesome. I mean, having just gone through a a major life milestone and you never know how weddings are going to be. My husband and I have been in the, we're in the wedding business from like 1988 to 2008 ish. I did weddings a little on and off after that. I was, you know, I was a photographer, but the, we started out as DJs. So (laughs) we've, we've seen it all at weddings. So it was really kind of odd to be on the other side of the, you know, aisle, so to speak, but you know, it was, it was beautiful. It was, mm. it was not a production. My daughter is very low key and I kept telling everybody, Oh, it's going to be really low key. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. And everybody's like, yeah, <laughs> they, all, they didn't believe me, <laughs> but everybody's like, this is one of the best weddings I've ever been Aww. to. And one of the things that one of the struggles we had, she and I was because my mom, when they first started planning mm. this in late 2019, early 2020, <laughs> like a lot of people, we were like, my mom was in late stage Alzheimer's. Do we bring her? If I bring her, do I need to bring somebody to kind of manage her? Because mm. she thought I was her best friend. She wouldn't have remembered anybody that was there. She wouldn't understand why she was there. But leaving her out felt bad. I mean, there's the whole discussion around. Do we bring her? Do we not? It's like bringing her doesn't feel right. Leaving her at if the residence doesn't feel right. It's just like, oh, yeah, yeah. So thankfully, for better or worse, that decision was taken away from us. And, you know, my daughter said, just invite the people that will help make the day enjoyable for you. And so everybody that was there was people we really like and wanted to be there with us. And they felt very honored to be part of that choice. So it was, you know, it's, it's sometimes we have to think differently about things. Yeah. That's, that's that's my statement. That's a powerful <laughs> statement. Well, your day sounds joyful. I want to say that. It sounds like it turned out 
just like your daughter wanted it to. And uh, that's that's priceless. But you're right about thinking different. Um, I'm a mediator and, and one of my chapters is on mediation in the book. And that is using mediation as a tool for finding that different way of thinking. Because most of the time we think we have two choices. We either invite mom or we don't invite mom, you know, or we talk to this person or we don't talk to this person. And my job as a mediator is to explore all the things on that spectrum that may work besides those two choices um, and open up possibilities. So that works, you know, in the legal decisions and the healthcare decisions and in relationships and how relationships are going to be moving forward. So I like that statement that you said. Yeah. A different it's, way of thinking. Yeah. Well, and it's, I spent the majority of my adult life doing what I needed to do. So I would not have regrets. Like my, mm. my paternal grandfather died somewhat suddenly. I did not have regrets with that. My maternal grandmother ended up with bone cancer. Um, both my sister and I had recently purchased new homes. We both had the desire to spend Thanksgiving in our first owned homes. And we ended up having to travel three and a half hours away to basically go spend time with my mom's family because it was likely grandpa's last Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And as frustrating as, it, as it felt at the time and being somewhat younger, <laughs> I think this was, he died in 98, I think 97, 99. Um, and it, you know, so I was like 32, so I was still a little bit young and stupid. And it was mm -hmm. like, I'm never going to have this opportunity to have Thanksgiving in my first owned home ever again, because that only happens once. But I knew it was important to be with him. But how would you help somebody kind of navigate, like if they really, really wanted to be at their home, but they really, really felt they needed to be with family? How do you kind of, yeah. how do you make that decision? How do you help them make that decision or how, how can you help them feel good about that decision? There we go. My brain yeah. will work soon today. <laughs> no, I hear you saying, how do you feel best about decisions when there's either a win on both sides or a loss on both sides? And for yours, it's a win-win, right? I can be in my new house or I can be, you know, with this family member who's important. Those are sometimes as difficult decisions as the lose-lose. You know, and there we have plenty of those kind of decisions and it is a struggle to make peace with them. For me, um, I try to look into the future. I mean, I go one year and then I go five years. You know, what will I maybe wish that I'd done um, if I look back on me then? And I have to add to that to say that for people who say, oh, I made a terrible decision, I should have done X, we don't know what the outcome would have been if we had done X. So sometimes we have to realize and give ourselves a grace and other people's a grace, uh, yeah, the same grace, that we're making the best decision we can with the information that we have at the time. And hindsight is 2020, right? Like the future... Well, honestly, Jennifer, my favorite thing to say is every moment is an experiment. Yeah, I like and that. And we're in a moment we've never been in before, every single moment. And sometimes we'll get it right. And sometimes they'll be like, yeah, that wasn't so good. But that's the opportunity to, to know. And we can't exactly apply that to the next moment because, again, every moment is different. But we'll kind of have more tools for making that next decision. So, yeah, I think... Um, you know, wherever your value is, it's not my not my place to decide. If you value that time in your home more, um, there's no shame or blame with that. That you get to pick that, right? And then have the peace of knowing that you weighed and and did the best you could in that moment. Well, we went and spent time with him because I knew mm -hmm. we would have other Thanksgivings. Yes, it wouldn't be the very first one in our very first owned home, but. That was, I did not want to regret the decision. So that was, that's kind of how I've always, when it's, when there's like a conflicting desire, I just, you know, it's like, hmm. well, how am I going to feel if I make this decision? You know, I don't want to have a regret. I don't, I don't want to say, man, I wish I should have, I should have spent that Thanksgiving with grandpa or I should have done X with mom or, you know, I, yeah. I, I wish I had like enjoyed the daughter's wedding more, which I trust me, I had plenty of fun. You know, so that's not even a thing, but it's like it it was interesting to let go of the professional wedding ser service person 
and just be a parent of the bride. Right. But, you know, I could have been a control freak. That's a, that's a, a, a family trait. But I just said, I'm just going to go and have fun. I mean, there was, <sighs> there was some procrastination and some things that didn't work quite the way she wanted. But in the end, it all came out fine. And she had, yeah. I think she had a lot more fun than I think she was expecting. She's not super social. So, you know, I just kept reminding myself, it'll all be fine. Mm-hmm. And it'll, you know, I will enjoy the day if I just accept that it's going to be fine and she will be happy and just not, just not worry about stuff I can't change. Like the weather, like Saturday night, windy as heck and cold. Last night, beautiful. Oh, so, yeah. Hey. Yeah. Don't so let so it, the perfection become the enemy of good is what, <laughs> uh, you know, it's like some, we miss good sometimes. I also hear you saying that you value people over things. And I think that's, that's for me, kind of one of my bars in making decision is I value relationships over a house, you know, mm-hmm. and knowing, and I think it's hard to go wrong then, unless there's resentment. If you're doing it from a place of resentment, then you're hurting yourself probably and the other person. But knowing that your own internal um, value system is that you value being with people over the things, um, I I think then you'll hold true to not having um, that regret later. Yeah, I think that applies to caregivers because I know, you know, I've got followers that are having to make decisions about not being able to attend other people's Mm -hmm. milestone events. Right. graduations, weddings, you know, trips with the girls or, you know, whatever, because they're taking care of a loved one. And it makes me really happy, but also really sad when I see them saying, you know, I appreciate that I have these, you know, I'm able to appreciate and enjoy these last moments with my loved one. And when they say moments, they're talking about, hmm. you know, little things that happen during the day, not that they're imminently you know, at the very end, very, very end of life, they're close, but it's just, I didn't get to see my mom the last two weeks of her life. So I didn't, I was very gl- grateful that I did everything I could to give her the best quality of life and the most joy up until COVID closed the doors mm-hmm. on us. But, you know, sometimes I look back and I, th- you know, it's hard because it's like, I've learned so much even in the last two years that It's like, man, I wish I'd known that then could have been even Mm. better. But that's why I keep doing this podcast, because I'm still learning. And I talk to people like you all the time, two and three a week. So if I'm still learning, um, excuse me, um, I feel like people that are listening are learning. So what how can we if we're dealing with caring for, say, our parent Mm. and they're reluctant to discuss legal matter, you know, any of the stuff, legal matters, healthcare matters, you know, they may say it's okay. I got it handled, but they don't want to talk about it. How can we kind of ease them into those conversations? <laughs> what a great question. I, I actually get that question a lot. How do I get people to come to the table if I'm willing and they're not? Um, so buy a book and leave a copy on their bedside table. <laughs> um, you know, I think coming from a place of, I want to know what you want. Like, I want this to be your story. I want to do it the way that you want it to do, to be, but help me understand. So I do run across people who say, well, I've got, you know, my legal work done. I've got my advanced directive and my will done. Everybody will see it when they see it. Well, that's true, but they won't, that won't help them when it comes time to deciding like whether or not you want a feeding tube or um, how much treatment you want. If you're getting chemotherapy, at what point do you want to stop? At what point do you want to continue? Uh, What do you consider quality of life? I do have these questions for conversation in my book in all areas, the legal, the healthcare, the relationship, um, that are just discussion questions. And you can make notes of those. And I, I think the more you understand, the better decisions we make, right? And the more time you have to prepare. And part of my being a nurse, the healthcare decision making part of the book was the most powerful, well, one of the most, the relationship part too with being a mediator. But I've seen so many people struggle and suffer Mm -hmm. because we err on the side of doing. 
right? Um, and we are all going to die and we have a hard time um, accepting that. So our death is not a failure of the healthcare system. Yeah, no, right? I've said that a lot. <laughs> it's not a punishment for something we did wrong. It's not, you know, a price we pay for eating too much bacon. I mean, it just, <laughs> it just is that we're going to die. And um, doing that well means that we get to choose what that looks like. And we have to have those conversations ahead of time. I do know, Jennifer, that um, as we live longer because of our healthcare advances, it is taking longer and harder to die, which yes. is hard on the people who are dying and they're suffering. And it's hard on the families who are and caregivers who witness the suffering and don't know how far to take that. So I think uh, my book tells uh, stories of different people who've made different decisions and different stages. And I think that lays a blueprint for uh, one of these things we don't talk about. You know, we just don't talk about it. Um, and in not talking about it, we're, we're all going through it. We're all struggling. So let's make it a conversation so that we all know we're in this boat together. We're all going to be there. I have um, a woman who is my counselor, my mentor, one of my best friends. Um, her husband had an acute diagnosis of a, a terminal nature. She's walking through that now. And they're literally on the life and death balance sort of thing. And she's she's in that. And she said, you know, I know we're all going to be there, you know. And she actually said, you know, I have your book. I keep your book. I wrote her a letter about, you know, understanding how hard these decisions are in the moment. Um we have to be aware of this process that we're in so the process doesn't take over us. And I want to say one more thing on that, Jennifer, and that is we trust people to make those decisions for us. And there Definitely. are decisions. There are decisions. Like we, we cannot turn the decisions on what you want your life or your loved one's life over to someone who doesn't know their whole story or doesn't know what they want. So giving voice to what we want, I think, becomes so important. Well, I think asking what does quality of life look to you mm -hmm. is a thousand percent quest better question than what do you want at the end of your life? Because my mom as mm -hmm. many, many people in her generation, I want to live in my home forever. Single family home across the street from an elementary school, not within mm -hmm. walking distance of any services at all. And, but she also said, but I don't want to be a burden on you girls. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Those are mutually exclusive. Thank you very much. And while you were telling your stories, I was like, because my family, my husband, my daughter, and I, and to some extent, our brand new son-in-law, I could stop calling him the almost son-in-law. Um, they've been together nine and a half years. So he's been around, a, he's been around for a lot of crap in our, our lives. The typical, you know, my daughter's got a chronic illness and, you know, my mom and my dad dying and dogs dying. And yeah, he's been through a lot of it with us. So, you know, he's here to stay. But my paternal grandmother had glaucoma from the time I was 12 to her death, which was in April of 2021. And in 2005, she fell and hit her face on the eye that had the most vision and stretched the retina and basically became almost completely blind. Now she was, she loved to read. She was very visual. She loved art and all of that stuff. And I thought, well, you know, grandpapa has been gone for, you know, five, seven years. And I'm trying to do math on a Monday morning after a busy weekend, <laughs> not a good thing, but I thought, mm, you know what, this is where she just hangs it up. Her, her mom got a pacemaker and because you can feel them. And because she was literally a prairie woman came across the country in a covered wagon, lived in a dugout. Yes. Little house on the prairie was her lifestyle. You know, she just, she could feel this pacemaker and it was just to keep the, um, she didn't have a lot of heart issues, but it was just to help regulate an irregular heartbeat, if I recall correctly, because I was 12 when she died. But she literally just said she just could not handle having this mechanical device keeping her alive. And she just gave up and just, yeah, you know, gave up literally. And so I thought, well, that's what my grandmother's going to do. So my daughter and I 
and my husband and the new son-in-law, we've had conversations just off the cuff on, you know, like which sense could we live with without, you know, Mm. like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I could go without being able to hear now because I listen to so many things, but I'm also really super visual. So I guess neither one of those are an option anymore now that I'm revisiting my choices, (laughs) but we've had that conversation based on what has gone on in our family. Mm. You know, my, my grandmother did not give up the ghost when she stopped being able to see. And, you know, she, she was one of those people that insisted on living in her home, which she did almost up until she died. It was the last nine ish months that she lived in board and care. Um, and it just, it's not that complicated a conversation. You know, it's like, Hey, Nana, Nana didn't give up the ghost because she can't see. So what, what's, what sense would you be able to live without my th- I think my daughter said hearing. I think hearing was the one we both thought we could live without, but not being able to see was not an option. So, you know, quality of life is a better question than this is my long roundabout way to get back to this. (laughs) You know, you you said something really wise. You said you revisit that based on other things that you see people go through. And I say even, and you're right, there's also a, we have a huge survival instinct. I mean, I've seen people fight to live when it they would have, you know, had zero quality of life. And basically they're just existing. I mean, in my career, I've seen that. And the existence keeps on. And I think what a what a what a big survival instinct they have, you know, the the just the will to live. Um, we never know what's going on inside of a head, though, you know, right? So so there is that too, and I think it's fair and right to say this is what I think for now, and when I get there, I revisit it because um, while it might seem that losing your sight is the most devastating thing you can imagine, we do tend to cope. We're pretty adaptable and. And then there's something else. Um, and that's that's OK. Uh, I've seen that's how most people probably do it. The question to have would be, what if you can't make that decision? You know, mm-hmm. how much how much do you go from there? And that's actually easier in some regards, because then if you can't make that decision, that speaks perhaps to your quality of life already. Yeah. And one of the conversations I have frequently is people who like my mom, you know, I want to live in my home forever. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Nothing happening. Or people who have promised, I'll never put you in a, you know, um, yeah. assisted living or memory care, not knowing how physically demanding the last stages of Alzheimer's or dementia can be. And like, I'm five foot two. My husband is six foot two. He already knows. <laughs> it's like the writing is on the wall if he gets Alzheimer's because I can't. I can't manhandle or woman handle somebody that's a foot taller and, you know, like 70 pounds heavier than me. It's just like not physically mm-hmm. possible. I may have all of the mental stamina and heart to do it, but, you know, that doesn't mean that I can physically do, it, especially you know, I'm only two years younger. So if he was, you know, 85 and I was 83, I don't, I don't think that's going to work. And they they have this tremendous guilt because now they're faced with like, I can't keep doing this, but I promised him I wouldn't. And one of the things that my mom had better quality of life living in memory care than had she lived with me, because that would have just been a fight every day because she had friends. There was activities that she would do that she would not consider doing with me. Super frustrating. That's I I told you control freaks. And, and, you know, we're, that's a family trait. I said that earlier. It's just, it you you just don't know and that was always my um my goal with her was to give her the best quality of life i mean she could not do the things i thought she should be doing hanging out with the grandkids traveling redecorating her house whatever mm. the hell my dad did not want to do he was gone she should have been doing that stuff but that was not an option so what options were open for me to help her have a you know a pleasant as possible end of life and we went and w- watched kids in the park and at the pool <laughs> people know that i say that all the time because that's what we did it's the only thing she was comfortable doing with me which was weird like i said she wouldn't do activities with me she wanted to just sit, sit around and shoot the breeze and that took way more mental 
gymnastics for me to yeah. do that I, yeah. I generally had the patience for. So, cause I didn't learn how to be in her reality until very late in the game. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Ooh, what a statement that is. I want to pause on that one I, <laughs> because you were talking about earlier what you thought she should be doing. And then you just said the most beautiful words and that was her reality. And I think the key is to try to be in the other person's reality for them to end their story. Well, that was beautiful, Jennifer. Mm, thank you. I, I'm going to say that the two things I hear the most, which are two truths. So I always say in mediation, we have to hold more than one truth because there are, there are parts, right? So one, is I want to stay in my own home. People definitely want that. And the other is they don't want to be a burden. Though I did run across a lady one time who raised three sons and she says, I want to be the biggest burden that I can be. Like I'm going to, I'm going to torture my grown sons because they tortured me when I was raising them. So I cannot wait till I'm in a nursing home and I'm going to call them every 15 minutes. But, but, but most people don't want to be a burden. It's true. And, and then we have the safety issue. But before we talk about that, I want to talk a moment about the regret. You said mm -hmm. my dad lived with me for um, almost 10 years, the end of his life. And for a good bit of that, um, we had a, a an apartment set up over a detached garage for him. He had his own place. Um, he wouldn't do very much or go out on his own very much. So I had to kind of do everything for him. But what I didn't foresee was a terrible divorce. Mm. And I had to move him and he didn't want to move. Um, and I told him that I sometimes get choked up and I tell the story that I would, I would move him somewhere. I would find somewhere better than what he had. And uh, there isn't better than your independence. You know, unless you're a sociable person, some people like that. Some people thrive in, you know, a, some some kind of facilitated um, living arrangement. But my dad was not one of those people. So I had to move him temporarily to somewhere. And that was hell for him. Mm. And his health decreased um, pretty quickly. And I was able to bring him back, but I, I couldn't take care of him at home at that point. I still had a child at home. Um was working, still going through the divorce. So I put him in assisted living and I'm a registered nurse and he's right down there. He's a mile away. And I go to see him every single day and his decline was pretty rapid. And I still have guilt around what I wanted, what I said and what was real. And all I can say about that, Jennifer, is that's just one of the hardships of life. Like it doesn't turn out the way we want. Um, but I know I I really know in examining my conscience closely that there wasn't anything else I could have done. So I will, I will live with that regret because that's part of my story. And, um, you know, I send my apologies up to him. I know at the end, um, you know, there were times he said, uh, you know, why are you so good to me? He thought I was his wife, you know, sometimes, which was heartbreaking as he, as he developed dementia, you know, I, I can't believe you're being this good to me. So I, I know it wasn't all bad for him and that's, that's helpful, but life sends us curveballs that we're not prepared for. That is, and we can <laughs> always look back and say, I could have, should have done that better. Um, but we can hopefully know that we did what we could at the time. And 
I don't say that as an excuse because I think there are things we learn from that that we can take into something else. But I do think this sometimes is just life and there aren't perfect solutions and there aren't easy answers and there aren't easy choices. If we haven't learned that from the last two years, then oh. <laughs> I mean, I get so frustrated that people get so angry because, you know, the government did this or they didn't do that. Or I mean, it's like. Who had a roadmap for what happened the last Amen. two years? I certainly didn't. And while I can I can see maybe that, you know, there been there were choices like we know the superintendent of both school districts in our old hometown. I don't envy them those choices at all because on right. one side parents are screaming, gotta get the kids back in school, which I agreed with. And the teachers are like, it's not safe. Okay, maybe. You know, and it's just, it's like... Oh, Nobody knew. Yeah, and it's like, can we just, just accept that there wasn't a good choice, we didn't yeah. have enough information, and and sometimes just being yelled at from all directions just didn't allow us to maybe take the time to make the best choice? I'm not even sure there was a best choice, because who mm -hmm. do you consider? In, in that scenario, it's very similar to whose life is more important, the person you're caring for, or yourself, or... Maybe, you know, your child that is still at home or your spouse that you're, you know, you're with. It's like at some point, you know, you feel like you're torn in three directions. So, yeah, if we have not learned that there's not always great choices, then my, we just. Uh, one, yeah. One of my mediation guru uh, people say that we try to find simple solutions to complex problems and there aren't. Right. That These are true. complex, like all those questions you just asked spoke to the complexity of the problems. And then we throw in blame because we want to find a reason. So we resort to blame. <clears throat> Excuse me. We could do a podcast on blame. I'd be happy to the toxicity of blame because there's nothing productive about blame. It doesn't help solve the problem. It builds acrimony. Um, but but it's a quick way to feel better. It's kind of like a drug, but it's a drug that's a poison, Good point. like many yeah. drugs are. So, um, <laughs> yeah, you, you raised you raised great points on that. Yeah, it's just I mean, it was frustrating. Like I work from home, so it, it wasn't a huge transition for me other than. Well, I'm not going out to the Rotary meeting and I'm not going to see my mom. So, OK. I mean, I wasn't super happy about it. I am a pretty big homebody. I, I my social battery is not super charged up all the time. And I'm, I'm one of those people that's like, this has been very nice. Thank you for coming to visit me now. Please leave. <laughs> when I'm Same. done socializing, I'm done. <laughs> Same. <laughs> and my husband can drag it out. Don't it's tell like, anyone. <laughs> I'm like, dude, like. These four children over here, I'm about ready to start clunking heads together because I'm done with like I've I've participated in the in the child stuff and now I'm done. Let's go home. <laughs> and he's still talking and blah, 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 blah. Ugh, frustrating. But, you know, I, I just we just roll with it because you just that's what you have to do. But the my biggest challenge during the pandemic was, you know, my mom had fallen and broken her leg. So I saw her the 8th, the 12th, the 14th and the 16th. And each day it got more difficult to enter. Difficult might be the wrong word. On the 12th, I entered the memory care residence as normal through the front door. Hey there, hi there, blah, blah, blah. You know, zero protocols, essentially. Mm. On the 12th, I had to go, or the 14th, I had to go through the main entrance through the assisted living, fill out a form that said I didn't have COVID. I'm like, I have no idea, but I don't, I feel fine. So, okay. And then... The last day I had to do the temperature and fill out the form. And I thought, well, this is going to be interesting because I normally have slightly low body temperature, but it's also kind of having like a warm flash because I'm of that age and I was running around. So I'm like, I hope my temperature is not elevated and I'm not going to be able to do what I need to do with my mom because this is really kind of becoming a real hassle. Mm -hmm. And we'd already gone to the grocery store to discover there was no toilet paper or rice or pasta or all that stuff that was that was almost more traumatic than anything else because I've never in my life experienced an empty grocery store shelf. Mm. Except, you know, like right after the holidays when the seasonal <laughs> stuff's gone, but still it was not even close. And then that that's the day the 16th was when California's governor said, that's it. All the counties in the San Francisco Bay Area are closed. Please stay home. And I sat there and I thought, okay, this is 
this is okay. And then after a week, I'm like, I'm not so happy with this anymore. My mom thought I was her best friend. And my biggest concern was she wouldn't trust me. She'd forget me and wouldn't trust me. And she would be more combative and more of a problem. And, but I'm like, I'm going to hold, hold the faith because we don't really know what's going on and everybody's doing the best they can. And I had a really good relationship with the executive director. So I, I was getting very close to calling him and saying, do I climb through the window? Do I put a bag over my head? What do you want me to do? Cause I'm coming in. And that's when they called. And, and my mom was on hospice at that point already, mostly cause I wanted the staff to have extra support. Not that I thought she was actually going to die. Mm. And they called and said, mom's not doing so great. We think she'd do well with a visit from you. And I walked in that day and I was like, oh yeah, this is not ending. Like I thought we are not going to the park in a wheelchair. We are not doing any of these things. And so I got to tell her, you know, she did a good job. You know, everybody was going to be fine. Blah, blah, blah. Go find dad, which was hard because I hadn't been able to talk to her about quote dad. It's like I said, she thought I was her best friend. And if I talked about dad, that confused her. So I'm like, I don't know which, which person I'm supposed to be in this moment, but I just decided I was going to be the daughter. And she was gone in about 27 hours. We almost got there before she died, but we were blessed because we got to go at the very beginning of the pandemic when they'd already closed the communities. 10 of us ended up outside my mom's door the day she died. Um, not that the executive director was not having a coronary about that fact. <laughs> My heart breaks for all the people who had people in different facilities that couldn't reach them uh, for the people and the families. I mean, I, I wrote a pretty long um, blog on that that had thousands of responses to it. It's I hope that's one thing we take away because we didn't do that well. No, we um, didn't. I, I hope we revisit how we do that. Um, but that's in the list of tragedies from the past couple of years. That's a, definitely a big one. One of the things that I tried to counsel my friends on that were still taking care of loved ones. I mean, and, and obviously it was easy from being on the other side and not having to make some of these difficult decisions was, yes, we need to protect them from COVID because they're a vulnerable population, but we can't kill them with isolation. Correct. And are we just dragging out dying from Alzheimer's or, you know, FTD or some other cognitive impairment? And that was the other thing with my mom. I was not going to do, I was not doing the things that would prolong her life, which sounds terrible, but it's like, she would not like to be where she was at at the moment. Mm -mm, mm -mm. If she had gotten worse, she, you know, she would have murdered me. Trust me. <laughs> it would have not been pretty. She did not want to end up like that. And I knew that. Mm -hmm. So like I would not have given her the COVID vaccine because I didn't think it would ne be necessary to protect her from that. But I would have wanted to give it to her to protect other people. Thank God I didn't have to make that choice. But that mm -hmm. all comes back to what quality of life do you want? You know, do you want to be bed bound and, you know, in diapers and somebody feeding you? None of us want that. So, you know, yeah. she... To, to, she picked the exact, right method. <laughs> well, it's exactly what you said. The choice between um, dying people are dying and the choice between living longer, the death being longer uh, versus having your family, you know, mm -hmm. being able to have a higher quality of life uh, in the end, though it might be a, a little bit shorter, maybe less painful, maybe. I mean, who knows? Like I, but I think, I think people need to make those decisions, but we have to get out of the, oh my gosh, I have to keep someone alive. We have mm -hmm. to keep out of that being the absolute, no matter what you should be alive, no matter what you should be making the most out of the life you have. I think it could be probably, a challenge. We oh, get stuck in our ruts. <laughs> of course it's a challenge. Yes. Life is nothing if not challenging, right? <laughs> well, I, I recently did a six day bicycle research tour with a journalist. And when I realized I was going to be gone for 10 days, home for four and then gone for six, I was like, I can't, I can't do that. That's not responsible. I have, I have things I need to do. I have mm. a podcast to put out. I got dogs to take care of. I got, I got things. I got, a, I got responsibilities. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You're fine. 
You're you're organized. You got everything planned out so that you can be gone. Don't back out on these people now. That'd be rude. So I went. And that's when my website blew up. That wasn't fun. But, you know, that was the last day of the of the trip. But I had to, like, tell myself, this is one of the things you wanted to do. Try it. If it totally sucks, then don't do it again. And it was there. I, I laughed because I was telling the journalist, thank you for showing me some of these charity bike routes that I will never do because they're really, really hard. <laughs> you know, Jennifer, I think uh, I'm hearing you say like you had to give yourself permission to have fun, to let go mm. of the responsibility and have fun and to give yourself permission. I wrestle with that all the time. But that's part of that. I mean, we're we're allowed to enjoy this journey too, right? Like exactly, <laughs> we don't have to just work, right? We're allowed to enjoy it because, yeah, you have that story of your bike ride now, which is very cool that you wouldn't have had. Like it added to your story. Whereas your work, I mean, I don't know about you, but I spend lots of time pouring into my work. Nobody knows, and if I stop, the world's not going to end. But it's so what how valuable is it in my story, I guess, which is part of the decision making process. I should have added that question in my book, but I didn't. <laughs> next next edition. <laughs> next and, edition. And it's, you know, I'm 55, so it's easy to say, well, you know, I could do that next year. But I swear I keep waiting for things to mellow out so I could do some of these other things I want to do that are will add to my story like you're talking about. And it's like, I just have to just jam them in there sometimes like i made all of the thank you cards for my daughter because being a millennial she, she's like oh i don't really need too many thank you cards because you know i'm just thanking all my friends in person and i was like my friends require my friends require an actual paper card thank you <laughs> and making homemade greeting cards is my zen it's my creative outlet and it's what i do to unwind and it's like if i don't get time to be creative i start getting a little cranky and unpleasant to be around so it's important for a lot of reasons and she was like i know you're having problems with your website if don't worry about the thank you cards i'm like oh i'm doing these suckers because <laughs> i just need to be able to focus on something pretty and mm. easy and happy because i'm gonna strangle somebody about this website <laughs> And you know what? They're done. They, I finished them the week before the wedding. It's all cool. You know, it's, you know, on to the next thing. And it's just, you can't always just focus on like all of the, you know, the, the crises in the moment. Sometimes mm. you just have to take a step back and go, I've done everything I can to mitigate this crisis. You know, I've interviewed web people. I've hired somebody. We don't know when our last moments are, so let's try to do everything we can to enjoy things because we cannot always operate in a crisis. We have to just say, I've done the best I can, and now I'm just going to take time for me, enjoy life, enjoy whatever, you know, TV show, glass of wine, dog napping on the floor, making cards, whatever it is that brings you joy. That is an important part of your story, so make sure you... You give yourself plenty of space for that. Yeah, you're allowed to have joy. So you have a passage from your book you wanted to read to us? I do, and it's ironic. We did not plan this out, but it, it just leads, what you said just leads right into this. So it's kind of the last paragraph in the, in the story part of my book. Finally, this I know to be true. I have one shot at this journey we call life. I don't know how long I have, but I know that I have one day less than I did yesterday. I also believe that we leave our legacy every moment, every interaction, no matter what we do and no matter where we're from. Every interaction with another person is an opportunity to leave a legacy of kindness or unkindness. Who we are in any given moment lives on. We are told in scripture to number our days. When we do just that by recognizing the finite nature of our days, I believe we can live purposefully, write a beautiful story, and die without regret. That's really beautiful. Thank you. And it's, I really feel like, and I'm not sure, I, this is obviously very cultural, and we need to start shifting away from this, and I would have hoped the pandemic would help people start moving that way. I'm not seeing a lot of evidence of it, but... Maybe since we're quote unquote sort of post pandemic, whatever that means to the world, 
maybe people are just they got to settle into a new normal. But, you know, we need we need to learn to balance and we need to learn to take care of ourselves mentally and physically so that, you know, maybe pandemics won't be as big a thing if it comes around again, because I've read climate change might actually make those worse, which sounds terrifying. (laughs) I hope that's not true. But, you know, life is really beautiful. And I always like to tell people sometimes, you know, you just have to stop and appreciate the simple beauties. The dog staring at the deer walking through the yard. I have a beautiful red Japanese maple that I can see outside my office window. And every time I glance over there, it makes me happy. I love Japanese maples. You know, it's just sometimes you just just take two minutes, appreciate something beautiful or, you know, a nice brewed cup of tea or coffee or a sweet treat. Breathe deeply and just, you know, there's a lot of beauty in life, even, you know, when we're taking care of somebody and it feels like everything is ugly and hard and challenging. There are times that we can appreciate and I think we need to focus on those a lot more. Jennifer, a really wise friend of mine told me about a Buddhist saying that says in life, There are 10,000 sorrows and 10,000 joys. The sorrows will find you. You must look for the joys. That is a beautiful place to end because I want people to to dwell on that one. We have to find the joys, which is kind of sad, but let's just all focus on the joys. One of the joys that I have is talking to wonderful people like Kim and the fact that all of you people are tuning in and listening to our conversation So I thank everybody and thank you, Kim. You can get a copy of her book. It's linked in the show notes and I'm sure that you will benefit tremendously from it. So once again, thanks so much, Kim. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.